Hi everybody, this is Dr. A, and we are going to talk about tumor markers for chapter 16 of Larson's Clinical Chemistry, and we're going to start with a case. So, uh, Tony's case, so Tony's 65, and he's suffering from trouble urinating. Only a small amount of urine comes out when he tries, and he feels uncomfortable because his bladder constantly feels full. His medical provider examines him and discovers an enlarged prostate. And so Tony is catheterized and produces a bunch of urine, probably at least a liter. I've seen as much as three liters with their uh, blocked, uh, you know, with the blocked urethra from the high, uh, the prostate, sorry, being all swollen. So um, he has an enlarged prostate, so therefore the physician's going to order a PSA. So that's a prostate-specific antigen level. And his results are 40 micrograms per liter, which is elevated. So uh, is this a routine screening test for prostate cancer in men? And what should a provider do next? Um, so do you think it's routine? And um, the answer to that is actually yes, it is a routine screening test in men at least age 50. Uh, and it's done to check for prostate cancer. Now it doesn't specifically like for sure diagnose uh, cancer, therefore, what should a physician do next? A provider should do next. Then is you want to do further testing. Um, oftentimes that does involve like a biopsy uh, and uh, to get a definitive diagnosis there for that patient. Because there is such a thing as benign prostatic hyperplasia where you just have an enlarged prostate and it's not prostate cancer. So cancer is the second most frequent cause of death in the United States. And Increasing age will increase the probability of getting cancer. So the older you are, basically, the more likely it is for something to go wrong where you're going to get cancer. But uh, other factors can affect the probability, um, things such as uh, smoking, being overweight, uh, and then exposures to variant environmental factors. Um, and tumor markers found in people with cancers, uh, most of them are non-specific type of tumor markers, and we're going to go over all the, the different types of uh, tumor markers. And um, they can, you know, they're usually either proteins, DNAs, hormones, it can be any, any so it's a variety, tumor markers encompass a, a variety of things. Um, but not all people with cancer will have positive tumor markers. So this is something that's important to, to distinguish. So let's talk a little bit about tumors. So first of all, a neoplasm, um, and that would be, if you will, like new, uh, and then plasma-like growth of tissue. So it's an abnormal growth of cells that has no physiologic purpose. So it's just there taking up space. It's not doing anything helpful. Um, Tumors can be benign or malignant. Um, benign meaning we're not worried about it, doesn't really, other than just being there, it's not causing any kind of health issues. Uh, and malignant are tumors that are growing and spreading and metastasizing, it means spreading to other organs and spreading throughout the body. This is what we don't want. Um, and uh, a benign one could be something, for example, like a lymphoma. It's just there, it's, you know, a, a nodule, and it doesn't cause problems other than sometimes it can be uncomfortable. Carcinoma in situ is a, the pre-invasive cancer. Uh, it is in the lining cells and it has not spread. So this is basically the earliest form of cancer you can detect. Um, and so it's the beginning of, there are changes in, on the lining cells, but those are really early changes. But if those changes progress, it could progress to cancer. Um, an example of where this is applicable for females, if you have, do your cervical swabs, um, they check for cervical cancer, but what they're looking for is really carcinoma in situ or the changes in the lining cells of the cervix that can indicate that you might be developing cervical cancer. So uh, tumors can be classified uh, in several ways. They're usually named after the type of cell from which they originate. So for example, an adenoma, adeno means gland, and oma is a mass, so it's uh, it originates from a, a gland, but an adenoma is always benign. Whereas an adenocarcinoma originates from a gland because it has adeno, but it's malignant, and you have, so therefore you have the carci, um, carcinogen, ca cancer um, 
root word in here to indicate that the difference between adenoma and adenocarcinoma. A fibroma is, comes from fibrous tissue and it's benign. A fibrosarcoma comes from fibrous tissue but it's malignant. Sarco means flesh, so it's like a flesh tumor, a flesh mass. And carcinomas always originate in the epithelium. So the epithelium is the lining cells, and you have a lot of lining. So just think of not only your skin, but then the lining of your GI tract, the lining of your respiratory tract, the lining of your reproductive tract. So at all those places where there's lining, those are the first line of exposure to chemicals and other things uh, in the environment. And so that's usually where things go wrong. As a matter of fact, like 90% of cancers do originate in that epithelial layer. Um, and sarcomas are found in connective tissues. So uh, the pathology of cancer is um, cancer cells need smaller amount of growth factors to grow so they can grow uh, easily and they um, grow uncontrollably. There is no contact inhibition. So contact inhibition is what is the signal that tells the cells, let's say if you had an injury or something and it has to replace some of the cells and make more, uh, once all the cells have contact with other cells, then it can reasonably deduce that it has filled the gap and we don't need to make any more cells. So this, there's contact inhibition that keeps um, the body from making too many cells, um, but you'll make enough to repair the damage. And um, so cancer does not have that contact inhibition. It'll just keep going. Anchorage, uh, is the anchorage is independent. So uh, it doesn't have to be anchored into, um, you know, the, its basement membrane or its uh, point of attachment. It can just keep going. So that doesn't, won't stop it from growing. Uh, and there is also no specific number of cell divisions. So um, normally cells have a certain amount of cell divisions and then they die. And this one, this is not regulated at all. Um, and then cancer cells lack specialized function and structures. For example, in anaplasia, um, meaning that, for example, let's say in leukemia, you have a bunch of a specific line of white cell. Uh, if it's a lymphocytic leukemia, it'd be lymphocytes, but the lymphocytes aren't functioning as part of the immune system as fully functional lymphocytes. They're just there and taking up space. And um, the cancer metabolism is parasitic so that it takes resources away from the healthy tissue to feed the cancer cells. So what are the causes of cancer? Um, they are inherited genetic mutations. So that, uh, there are some genetic mutations that can be passed uh, from family to family um, and generation to generation where um, it just makes you more susceptible to cancer, types of cancer. Um, sometimes you can see that in families. So in my ex-husband's family on his mom's side, like all of his, actually all of his grandma on his mom's side, like all of her, her and all of her siblings have all died of cancer. So there's definitely a genetic predisposition in that family to, to cancer. Uh, there can also be acquired genetic mutations. So acquired genetic mutations are usually through uh, exposures to things that can cause gene mutations, such as you know, ultraviolet lights, radiation, uh, certain chemical exposures. Um, and so some of the causes of cancers also have to do with proto-oncogenes. So uh, those are normal genes that have been uh, altered by mutations and become oncogenes or genes that drive cancer and they promote uh, cancer. So those, those are genes that promote cancer. Those are genes that um, normally you want these genes silenced. You want them to not be um, active because if they active then cancer is what um, is going to come out as a consequence. And then you have your tumor suppressor genes and these should be active. So you have some right now in your body that should be active and um, they're, they're looking to suppress tumors and they do that by producing certain chemicals and if that gene is inactivated or silenced then there's nothing to suppress the cancer and in those cells and then they can lead to proliferation of the cells and make cancer tumors um, and there's uh, so part of these proto-oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes how they are um, they can be turned on or turned off is through uh, epigenetics. And so 
Um, that can be epigenetics, gene silencing, or gene activating. So if you know if you activated a proto oncogene, then you're going to get some cancer. But if you silence a tumor suppressor gene or another healthy gene that is protective, then you can also get cancer. And uh, Epigenetics are changes in the phenotype without changing the genotype. So it's not a gene mutation, it's just a turning on or turning off of genes. And so basically, if you turn off the helpful one and turn on the harmful one, then you're going to have disease or you're going to have cancer. Um, and this turning on and turning off is done by uh, methylation and acetylation of the DNA code. So making, for example, a way to turn it off is basically it locks the two DNA strands where they cannot be opened in red. And uh, the way you activate it is to make it easier for those genes to be opened in red. If you want, it's a very simplistic way to put it, but it conveys the message. Okay, so uh, what are those two genes? The two genes that are responsible for the growth and spread of neoplasm that we just discussed. Um, so name those two uh, categories, really categories of genes, really. Okay, so um, if you're in my class, we're going to play this video um, as part of your Nearpod activity. I'm going to link this below for our YouTube people. Um, so this is really interesting. It's simply, uh, what are all the different risk factors that, that things that put people uh, more at risk for cancer? So if you've spent a minute in healthcare, you're probably going to know a lot of these. So let's talk a little bit about metastasis. So this is really a, the word that you don't want to hear. You do not want to hear that the cancer has metastasized. So it's the spread of the disease from one site to another. So what happens is cells can break loose from the main tumor and then travel. They can travel through the lymphatic system. They can travel through the blood system. Uh, they can travel to nearby tissues. And um, then they can make their home. Uh, they find another uh, hospital environment and uh, they make their home there and they start making a mass over there. So for example, um, if somebody has breast cancer that has metastasized, one of the places that it can metastasize to is the liver. And so they have tumors in their liver, but they don't have liver cancer. They have breast cancer. Those are breast cancer cells that are have found a home in the liver. That's what so it's an important distinction because you can get liver cancer also. So uh, how do we diagnose in stage cancer? Um, so first of all, tumors will exert pressure on your bad tissue causing signs and symptoms that are usually what, uh, if there are any, what the patient will come and complain about uh, because it is a growth. So it can, it can you know, um, restrict movement or, or it can restrict the flow of uh, blood or nutrients to a certain tissue and usually there's pain and discomfort um, associated with uh, the presence of those tumors. And uh, tumors can be either well differentiated or poorly, poorly differentiated and this has to do with um, how uh, the how clear it is that you can you're able to tell tumor from non-tumor um, and therefore then how easy it's going to be to remove that uh, tumor if it is removed surgically and so there's uh, in the diagnosis there's also cancer grading and cancer staging and so this is after of course there's been some imaging some investigation the tumor's been found and then um, usually the next thing is to get a biopsy or some way to test these cancer cells and to see what's going on. And uh, so cancer grading has to do with the pathologist looking at it under the microscope. So we're looking at what the cells specifically look like, and that's going to be grading. And I'm going to talk to you about that in the next slide too. And then staging involves not only a physical exam in medical history, but also diagnostic imaging. Um, and this is where we're looking for spread of the cancer. And so here, for example, in grading, um, so if it's grade one or two, and this is always with increasing severity going from one to five. So if it's one or two grade, um, the cells are abnormal, but they still organize in the structures that they're supposed to be in. So for example, here, uh, there's all rings, so this would be a gland of some sort. And um, this could, in could indicate a slow growing cancer or something that's been caught early. 
uh, grade three, there's more variation in shapes and size of the cells. You see fewer distinct rings, for example, in this gland. Uh, and so these cancer cells could be growing more rapidly, but they could possibly also be slow growing, but you're just further along in the process. In grade four or five, then the, the, they form irregularly, irregularly closely packed rings, or they don't form rings at all. They vary even more in size and shape uh, than the lower grade cells, and this can indicate a fast growing cancer or a cancer that's progressed quite a bit. Whereas in the stage staging, um, is not done with microscopy. So staging, you, you look at the patient, there's physical exam and imaging that's done. And so stage zero is carcinoma in situ. This is the very earliest form where you just have some cellular changes in the lining cells and that's it. Stage one is localized. So now those changes have become more advanced and they've spread some within the tissue. Okay, so still localized to a specific tissue. Um, stage two is early locally advanced, so they, it's progressed into maybe an adjoining tissue or it's starting to progress into a, a lymph node that's nearby. Late locally advanced is progress even more, spread even more, and uh, this is where you can have multiple lymph node involvements. And then stage four is when it has metastasized, meaning it has spread to another organ. Um, again, the liver is a site of spread. The brain can be another site of spread. Uh, and this all depends on the type of cancer. Um, and so you go stage zero to stage four, which is the most type, uh, advanced type of cancer. Okay, so this is going to talk about grading and staging for breast cancer. Again, we'll play it in class, but if you're new to it, I'm going to link it below. And so, um, so what is the difference between grading and staging tumors? So answer that. If you're not sure, you can rewind and listen to it again. So uh, let's talk more specifically now about tumor markers. So tumors, tumor markers are produced in a response to the tumor, to the presence of a tumor, or they might be made by the tumor. But they are nonspecific for cancer. So this is very, very, very important. And because they're nonspecific for cancer, we can't really use them for screening except for the prostatic specific antigen. That's the only one that we found that is specific enough and it's just male prostate. And that's it. So, um, meaning like if that tumor marker is present, um, there are some things like, for example, smoking can increase the levels of some of these tumor markers without lung cancer being present. Um, and some of the cancers, um, the tumor markers can be found in very varying different types of cancers. So again, it's not very specific. You can't, other than PSA, you can't really specifically say, oh, this is present, therefore you have that type of cancer. So why do we use them? We use them to monitor and detect recurrence. Um, they're also somewhat used in the diagnostic process. So it has to be taken in as part of the whole picture. But um, what they do is if they, um, that tumor, a specific tumor antigen is present and you've been diagnosed with a specific type of cancer or your patient's been diagnosed with a specific type of cancer uh, and that uh, antigen, that tumor antigen or tumor marker was present, then we can use the tumor marker to monitor therapy to see if therapy is being successful. And then um, let's say therapy was successful and a patient is in remission, then you can also use the tumor marker to detect a recurrence of the cancer. And it's, of course, less invasive because you can just do blood draw and monitor those levels and they start creeping back up, then it could be that a cancer is returning. Um, something that you really need to pay attention to is um, a tumor marker test has got to state the methodology and the instrument that was used to obtain the results. And this is because you cannot interchange results between different manufacturers. They can have completely different ranges with different methods and different analyzers. So you can only compare apples to apples. So uh, if a patient came to your facility and had um, a tumor marker done, then it is your facility that has to do the monitoring and the detecting of recurrence. Um, if they're sent, for example, to a cancer treatment institute, like let's say MD Anderson, or they're sent to um, 
you know, uh, St. Jude's if they're a child, um, then what they have to do is they have to re-baseline the specimen to their, their method and their analyzer at that cancer site. And then as long as they're part of the, um, the patient seeking therapy there, then they're the ones who they will monitor based on their baseline. So again, it's very important to know if especially patients are going back and forth between different treatment locations or um, different hospitals that you cannot use those values from different hospitals or different methodologies or different instrumentation interchangeably. Uh, and it should always use them with medical and surgical information. So it is not a long diagnostic in any kind of way. You have It is part of the whole picture of everything that's going on with the patient and it helps point towards the diagnosis and then monitor and treatment and detect recurrence. So a quick little question to check your understanding. So tumor markers should only should be used for is it diagnosis, monitoring, or screening? So what is the best use, I would say, of those three for tumor markers in general? And if you're not sure, just rewind the answers before that. Okay, so there are several types of tumor markers. You have your oncofetal antigens. So this is uh, fetal antigens, so these are antigens that are, or proteins that are normally uh, present in the fetus, and then they make a reappearance because of the oncoid of cancer. So uh, this is alpha fetoprotein, carcinoembryonic antigen. Some enzymes can be used as tumor markers, like alkaline phosphatase. Um, hormones, certain hormones can be used, uh, like ACTH or beta-HCG, like for example, beta-HCG can be used in testicular cancer in men. Uh, and then some of them are carbohydrates, sometimes also referred to as cancer antigens, but it's supposed to be carbohydrate antigen, and it depends, I've seen those both used interchangeably, like CA125 for cervical cancer. They can be DNA markers, so certain D, uh, genes, so the, the HER2, BRCA1, BRCA2, and then they can be receptors also, such as uh, the estrogen receptor or the progesterone receptor, especially in uh, bre breast cancers. Okay, so I'm going to open this web page here. Just um, sorry about that. This is it made me go out there. Uh, we're going to do location access. Okay, I just wanted to talk about liquid biopsies. I thought that was really cool. So it's a new way uh, to do biopsies that are less invasive. Um, and so um, usually, um, so it depends on the patient and their you know how advanced they are but um, they can just draw the blood and um, if they're maybe not stable enough um, you know a biopsy could be really too dangerous um, you can draw the blood and then um, what what happened is some of the the dna and the markers and stuff from the tumor are present in the blood and um, so the, these tumor bar mar markers that can be used in this liquid bi biopsy are cell-free DNA, circulating tumor cells, and exosomes and microvesicles. Uh, and so um, anyway, this is pretty interesting. I'm going to put the link to it also below for those of you guys who want to check out liquid biopsy. Uh, but yes, it's essentially done off of a blood draw. Uh, so no anesthesia, no surgery, no invasive procedure required here. Okay, so I'm going to go back to here. All right, so let's start back on our um, oncofetal antigens and then our enzymes. So the oncofetal antigens are normally produced by the fetus. Once you become an adult, you don't produce these antigens anymore. The two primary ones are alpha fetoprotein and carcinoembryonic antigen. So alpha fetoprotein is also abbreviated as AFP. And uh, you see it in primary hepatoma, so it'll be a liver mass, ovarian carcinoma, and testicular embryonal carcinoma. It's uh, a normal product of liver cells, and it's found in very low levels in normal patients. Your carcinoembryonic antigen, also abbreviated as CEA, is mostly found in colon carcinomas, and it's very useful for detecting recurrences after a tumor has been removed. Uh, that was, of course, associated initially with an elevated CEA. It is also used to monitor therapy, and these both are measured using immunoassays. Uh, enzymes are really not used frequently anymore. Uh, there's neuron-specific NLAs can be done, like I said, also alkaline phosphatase, uh, 
present in bone, but it's just so many other things can uh, raise the enzymes. It's just they've, they've kind of faded away for um, the use as tumor markers. A prostate-specific antigen is used as a screening tool for prostate cancer. Um, a free PSA is used in conjunction with a total PSA, um, and it's done to evaluate a patient's risk for prostate cancer. Uh, and this is when the total PSA is greater than four nanograms per mil. Our patient that we looked at, our case was 40, so it's 10 times normal. Um, and so, like, if you if a, a male had it drawn and their level was two or three, or even maybe right at four, then what they might do is just take a let's wait and see approach and draw it again in a few months and six months and see. Is it just kind of just holding steady? Is this just like low? I mean, it's there, but it's it's not beyond four. Or is it gradually going up, meaning maybe there's some prostate cancer that's developing? Your hormone tumor markers are often used to monitor treatment. Um, there are two mechanisms for hormones and how to act in cancer. Either um, excess hormone can be produced by the endocrine gland uh, due to the cancer. So it's just cranking out a bunch of, uh, for example, thyroid hormone and the thyroid cancer. Um, or you can have non-endocrine production. So uh, meaning a cell other than the endocrine cell is producing the hormone. So for example, with adenocorticotropic hormone, it's a non-endocrine production. So small cell lung cancer can produce a CTH. A CTH is normally produced by the pituitary. All right, um, and calcitonin is produced by uh, medullary thyroid cancer. Um, and the, the cells are the parafollicular cells in the thyroid that make calcitonin. And so they get stimulated to make calcitonin. But calcitonin is made in the thyroid. So it makes sense that with uh, medullary thyroid cancer that you would see elevated levels of calcitonin. Beta HCG is made in testicular carcinomas. Normally guys don't make beta HCG. Uh, this is the pregnancy hormone. And so once it has been established that excess hormone production is caused by a tumor, then you can use those hormone levels to be used to monitor treatment. You have to make sure that it can be correlated there. Then your carbohydrate tumor markers are uh, also obviously used to monitor treatment because that's the main use of tumor markers. Um, and there are either antigens on tumor cells or there are uh, little proteins that are secreted by the tumors. Um, their specificity is higher than that of enzymes and hormones. Some of the most commonly done are CA15-3 and CA2729 um, for breast cancer. CA2729 tends to be used more frequently. CA125 is ovarian cancer. And CA99 is colorectal and pancreatic cancers. Um, these markers are all available by immunoassay and they're very commonly ordered. There are others that are around, but they're more done in research. So CA549, 242, and 724, um, they're, just, they're just not performed by many labs, including reference labs. So they um, don't have as much value in clinical application. UDNA markers and receptors. So again, there were two types of genes that can lead to cancer, your oncogenes uh, that are turned on and tumor suppressor genes that are turned off. Uh, one of the oncogenes is a HER2. So the HER2 assays are becoming more and more available. This is a, really a common one now for breast cancer. Um, and so there are immunoassays available to measure serum levels of HER2 in patients with breast cancer. Um, previously though, HER2 was only done on tissue sample, but we can do it on blood now. Uh, you have BRCA1 and BRCA2. This, these are genes that um, would put you at higher risk for breast cancer. It's not a definitive. It just simply is a higher risk. And uh, then the receptors like the estrogen receptors and progesterone receptors are used to determine whether hormone treatment is appropriate for patients with breast cancer. So, for example, if um, a patient had was estrogen receptor positive on a breast cancer, if you gave them estrogen as a therapy, I believe it would just feed the cancer, uh, and you wouldn't want to do that. Okay, so give me two functions of tumor markers, or two ways that we can use tumor markers. If you're not sure, go back uh, a little sooner, rewind the video. And what are the two carbohydrate tumor markers that can be used to monitor breast cancer? 
uh, select which one, the ones we want also. And another question to check to see how you're doing here. Give me one awkward fetal antigen uh, there we go, that we can test for. Now let's get into specific cancers. So we're going to start with breast cancer. Uh, early detection does increase survival rates. That is the purpose of getting mammographies, uh, especially uh, once a woman is past 40. Uh, Biopsy is always used to confirm. Um, only 5 to 10% of breast cancers are linked to genetic mutations past your family. So there's a small percentage. So again, um, whether you have the BRCA gene or don't have the BRCA gene, um, that, that only accounts for 5 to 10% of the breast cancers, right? Um, and so you could not have the BRCA gen gene and still get breast cancer. Or you could have a BRCA gene and be lucky maybe to have a good lifestyle and not get breast cancer. Although it is far more common in women, breast cancer can also occur in men. Um, tumor markers are used to monitor the treatments in breast cancer, and therapy is guided by the estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, and the HER2, um, and uh, CA15-3 and CA2729 are used to just monitor therapy itself. But these these ER, the estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, and HER2, like their status on all of those, determines which therapy will be selected uh, because they know which one is effective uh, in, in, with which combo of these uh, being positive or negative. All right, colon cancer is the most common gastrointestinal cancer and one of the most common cancers in the U.S., uh, individuals that have a family history of colon cancer, um, especially if more than one relative has had the disease, are obviously at an increased risk because there are not only genetic factors, but environmental factors. And even though environmental factors can change, you know, between, like, depending where people live, what happens is usually families have similar environmental factors. They live in the same area or they were raised in the same household and they have the, some of the same exposures so that within families you can have genetic and environmental and they combine to increase the risk. Uh, chronic inflammatory conditions will always uh, just make you more at risk uh, for cancer. And so in colon cancer, that would be um, th such things such as you know, irritable bowel disorders, uh, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, anything that's inflammatory into your bowel can put you at high risk for colon cancer. Carcinoembryonic antigen is what is used to monitor col colon cancer. Um, and then CA19 high le levels can also be used to monitor this disease. Um, very high levels of CA19 can be seen in patients with a poor prognosis, meaning they likely will not survive this, and treatment's not going to work. Um, and like most of the assays, tumor markers, again, should be diluted out until the result is obtained because of the hook effect of immunoassay, meaning if this is super, super, super high, then it may read like it's not there at all. Um, and CA99, especially, these results can be seen at greater than 120,000 international units per mil, which is really high. Hepatocellular carcinoma, so this is a cancer of the hepatocytes, or a type of liver cancer. It often occurs concurrently with cirrhosis of the liver. Um, annual cases, however, are decreasing, um, but alpha fetoprotein uh, levels can be used to uh, monitor hepatocellular carcinoma or liver cancer. Lung cancer, there are several types of lung cancer. There's small cell carcinoma, non-small cell carcinoma, and large cell lung cancer. Uh, small cell carcinoma was once called oat cell carcinoma, and you can, this is the one, we, the one where you can use an enzyme, you can use neuron-specific NLase, uh, and these can be used to correlate with the disease stage of lung cancer. Obviously, you're going to get imaging with lung cancers, uh, also to see the tumor, whether at in biopsies. Uh, your non-small cell carcinoma is the most common type of lung cancer, and radiography is used to diagnose it. And large cell lung cancer, also radiography is used to uh, diagnose it. So for the most part, lab tests are not used frequently to diagnose or monitor lung cancers. Um, but obviously, your lab tests can be used to assess how the lungs are functioning. So that would be in your ABGs to see oxygenation and what's going on there. Melanoma uh, is a malignant transformation of your melanocytes. Your melanocytes are the skin's cells 
that give your skin its color. So uh, they produce melanin. The more melanin you produce, the darker your skin tone. Um, they are what give you a tan if you're out in the sun. So early diagnosis is critical for melanoma and uh, it only has a histologic marker and that's the S100. There's not a blood test for it. Uh, and so this is where you're looking for, you know, uh, little tumors on the skin or moles that have weird shapes or weird color. Um, so anything that you think is suspicious is worth to um, go have it checked out because this, it can spread uh, metastasize and be deadly. Multiple myeloma um, is a in cancer with an increased level of monoclonal paraproteins. Um, routine lab tests uh, diagnose and monitor this disease, especially uh, serum electrophoresis, um, and uh, also to monitor treatment. So in the normal pattern is here in blue of normal serum protein electrophoresis pattern. In multiple myeloma, you see a, a diffuse uh, monoclonal band here at peak in the gamma region. And uh, as treatment is successful, the level of the monoclon monoclonal gammopathy will go down. Ovarian cancer is a group of lesions on the ovaries. It is the most deadly gynecologic cancer and CA125 is used to monitor ovarian cancer. Pancreatic cancer is very difficult to diagnose. If the patient is diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, there is a very poor prognosis. So there is a very slim chance of them surviving this. Uh, it is very deadly uh, and it doesn't take that long for patients to die of pancreatic cancer. Most lab results are not helpful in the diagnosis, not even your amylase and lipase or anything that would typically be helpful for pancreatic issues is not helpful for pancreatic cancer. If elevated, CA99 and or CEA can be used to monitor, but they may or may not be there. So it's one of those things that, you know, it can be, you can run them and maybe they'll be there and then, then they can be used, but it's very possible to have pancreatic cancer and have negative values of those. Prostate cancer, so has to be differentiated from benign prostatic hypertrophy, hypertrophy the, what they're calling BPH in the commercials which is just an enlarged prostate that is not prostate cancer. Um, the limit, limit of normal has been put in question. Um, so um, that what you're, but what you're really looking at is the velocity of increase in the PSA levels. Uh, and that is what is used to determine the need for biopsy. Just kind of like what I said earlier. So sometimes if a patient is kind of close to that limit of normal, uh, what you might do is, the physician might do then is simply repeat the test in a few months. And if it's not increased, if it's staying steady, then we're not as concerned. But if every time you test it doubles or it's increasing, so it's increasing more and more, there's a velocity of increase, then we want to do biopsy and see what's going on. Um, Free PSA, uh, the lower percent of free PSA uh, in, in proportion to the total PSA, then the higher chance it is uh, that it is cancer. Uh, testicular cancer, so these cancers will grow from germ cells, the cells that produce sperm. Um, they are non-seminomatomous germ cell tumors, um, and um, there are also seminomas. So the non seminomatous germ cell tumors will show elevated alpha fetal protein or elevated beta HCGs. Uh, the seminomas tend to be slow growing and show only elevated beta HCGs. Um, and the non seminomas tend to grow more rapidly. Alpha fetal protein levels can be as high as a million nanograms per mil. So again, another one we would have to delete to avoid that hook effect. And all testicular cancers have to be confirmed by biopsy. And then I'm going to link this video. We're going to play in class. So why have we cured cancer yet? We've been spending millions and millions, if not billions of dollars in cancer research since the 1970s. And here we are. It's still a prevalent disease um, that we're good at treating some of them and not so good at treating so many other ones. Uh, so that will answer that. And then if you're in class, if you have any questions, let me know. Uh, if not, you can drop them in the comments. And you guys have a wonderful day.